good afternoon uh, for those of you who are in Australia or other parts of the world. Good day. So um, welcome to Kipes DCC webinar. Can you imagine this is our 13th webinar uh, this week? Uh, it's really good to see you all again here, or maybe some of you are a newcomer for this webinar. So Kipes DCC is a collaborative Australia-Indonesia programs on sustainable development and climate change. And today we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 to the SDGs project. Thank you very much for those of you who have registered to our event. We have more than 1,100 registered participants. It is more than the capacity of the Zoom account that we have. Our sincere apology for those of you who can't enter the Zoom room. Hence, we also set up a live stream option via YouTube. Hello all who watch this from YouTube. I hope the YouTube is already alive right now. You can all say hi to each other by writing down your name, your organization, and uh, which city you are coming from in the chat box. So we know where you are coming from. I'm Leah Zakia, the program coordinator of Kites DCC. Uh, and then here, uh, I will be your host for this webinar. Um, so Kites DCC is a collaboration between Griffith University of Australia and Universitas Indonesia, along with some other universities in Indonesia, such as Universitas Hasanuddin in Makassar. The collaboration has several components. The first component is a research collaboration on climate change and sustainable development. We focus on the four themes. The first one is impacts of climate change on planetary and human health. The second one is sustainable landscape management. The third one is energy transition and carbon pricing. And then the fourth one, increasing resilience of small islands in Eastern Indonesia. This research collaboration component aims at enhancing the science to policy principle. Therefore, we have included various stakeholders to the research, uh, and then also national and local government, private sectors, NGOs, and communities. The second component of Kipes DCC is the capacity building. The third one is student mm -hmm. mobility between Australia and Indonesia. And the fourth one is the high level dialogues and a series of webinars. Today's event is under this component. Now I'd like to explain some housekeeping rules to make sure that we have an enjoyable session and a meaningful discussion. The participants don't have to fill in any attendance list. So no need to ask, you know, where's the form? Where, where can I sign my attendance? You don't have to do that because we will get the attendance report from Zoom. So you can just focus on the materials. You can write down your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, Q&A box. We usually receive a lot of questions. It is challenging for us to answer all, but we will do our best. Make sure that you read the existing questions first before you write down your own. Just in case it has similarity with yours, then you can just upload it by clicking the thumbs up icon. For YouTube viewers, you can also write down your questions. No need to worry. Our team will move it to the Q&A box in the Zoom to ensure that it can be seen by other participants at Zoom to be upvoted. The chair will focus on the most popular questions with the most output or the most relevant to the discussion at the moment. The present presentation materials can be downloaded in our Google Drive account. We will, uh, we will share the link at the end of the webinar, so no need to worry. Information about the requests for certificates will be shared in the end of the webinar, so stay tuned. We also conduct poll today, so I hope all of you can participate by answering the questions that we will share later uh, uh, about the result. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, wherever you are right now, um, before we start the discussion, I think it's uh, great to hear uh, some words from uh, the representative of uh, Griffith Asia Institute, which is one of the leading partner, in, well, the initiator of this uh, from the Australian side. So today we have Prof. Kathleen Byrne, who is the director of the Griffith Asia Institute. She's also a faculty, a faculty fellow of the University of Southern California Center for Public Diplomacy. And her research focuses on Australian diplomacy with a special interest in Australia's engagement in the Asia Pacific region. Most recent research projects explored the role of leadership, soft power, and public diplomacy, including people to people connections developed through international education, culture, or sport uh, in uh, developing Australia's regional influence. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Prof. Kathleen. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Leah. Good evening, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. 
Uh, so, Selamat pagi to all of our participants joining from Indonesia. Thank you for joining us again. And good afternoon to those of you who might be joining us from across Australia. One of the things that's uh, customary practice for us in Australia is to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting right across uh, the widest reaches of this virtual platform. So let me do that and pay my respects to uh, Indigenous elders past and present. And I extend that respect to all First Nations people, including any of those who might be joining us today, uh, welcome. I think this is a really important session that we're talking about today. And as Leah has mentioned, this is the 13th webinar and we're really proud that we've been able to sustain and build a conversation across Australia and Indonesia, focusing on some of the biggest challenges that we are both facing and our region is facing. Uh, the dual challenges of sustainable development and climate change. Particular series of webinars at the moment are really focused on sustainable and low carbon development for economic recovery. And out of this discussion, you know, we really do have to be thinking about the impacts of COVID-19 on that recovery process and how that will impact on the way that we as nations and as a region are going to be able to advance the sustainable development goals. So it's a really uh, a wicked problem and very difficult problem that we're faced with. The coronavirus pandemic has in many ways shown us a new world where the status quo is challenged just about every single way. And we know that the reach of COVID-19 is really only just now beginning to be fully felt right around the region. The UNDP estimates that global human development, a combination of education, health and living standards could fall this year for the first time since 1990 when measurements began. And if I can quote uh, an administrator from the UNDP who mentioned, the world has seen many crises over the past 30 years, including the global financial crisis of 2007-9. Each crisis has hit human development hard, but overall development gains accrued globally year on year. COVID-19 with its triple hit to health, education and income may well change this trend. So it's a, a, in some ways a, a a worrying, even gloomy outlook as we look forward uh, to 2030, when the initial aspiration was that the sustainable development goals would be realised. But I think there are also moments of, of optimism and we should really look for opportunities for us to lift our aspirations and to really advance movement towards the sustainable development goals and in particular through the economic recovery from COVID-19. And in fact, there may well be opportunities that we hadn't even thought about before. So we have some really excellent speakers uh, who will be taking this topic on today, uh, joining us from Australia and from Indonesia. Prof Akmal, who uh, will be joining us from Universitas Indonesia, but also plays a role in Indonesia's COVID-19 task force. Uh, Professor Cheryl Desha from Griffith University, who's an expert in disaster management, resilience and recovery. Um, Ibu Inda, who is joining us from the Indonesia Business Council for Sustainable Development. And I hope we'll be able to shine, some, shine a light on how we can really develop a multi-stakeholder approach moving forward. And Ibu Corina, who will be the moderator for today's event, joining us also from Universitas Indonesia. We really appreciate the time that, that our experts are giving to us today. Uh, so thank you very much. And if I can also just acknowledge our partners, I'd like to make special mention of Pakrakmad Witala, our patron in this collaborative partnership, who I'm sure is joining either via Zoom or YouTube. Also, Prof. Yadna Supriyadna from Universitas Indonesia, uh, you know, a world-class expert in his own right. We're, we're so proud to be able to work with Prof. Yadna. And Prof. Brendan Mackey at Griffith University, who's leading uh, climate action research from our end of the world. Uh, and I'd like to make special thanks to Leah and Hendika, who pull all of these webinars together and do an amazing job in doing that. 
So thank you very much, everyone. We're really delighted you're with us, wherever you might be joining us from. Uh, we look forward to your questions and your comments that come through today's webinar and hope that you're able to connect again. And Leah, over to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Kathleen. A really good opening remarks. Uh, so hopefully you can join uh, with us until the end of the session. So you have to run to another meeting later. Nice. So ladies and gentlemen, now I think it's time for me to introduce our wonderful chair for today, uh, Associate Professor Corina De Rianto Putra or Ibu Kori. Through rigorous research and clear communication, Corina tries to understand, inspire, and enable responsible leadership and human resource developments to achieve diverse, healthy, and vibrant workplaces. She received her doctoral degree from the University of New South Wales, Australia in 2010. Her two ongoing international research collaborations are with the ASEAN Productivity Organization and a Global Leadership and Organizational Behavior Effectiveness. Her awards include Outstanding Paper Award, uh, Teaching Excellence, and the Best Thesis Supervisor Award. Mm, I would love to, to have her as my thesis supervisor later, maybe. In addition to her role as a lecturer in the Faculty of uh, Psychology in uh, Universitas Indonesia, Corina is now serving as a member of the University Board of Universitas Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ibu Kori. Over to Ibu Kori. Thank you very much, Leah. Very uh, warm welcome. Good morning, everyone, or good uh, afternoon for those in Australia. And uh, I'm very delighted to be your chair at this uh, webinar because so many of you have uh, uh, registered to this uh, webinar. We have uh, people from various backgrounds, uh, academician, government, business people, NGO from the media. We all come here to share ideas, to learn more about something that passionately, uh, that we passionately work uh, for the sustainable developmental goals. I'm um, so also so delighted that people not only from Jakarta that come here, but, but from all over Indonesia. Indonesia consists of 17,000 islands, and I can see people from uh, uh, Aceh until from uh, East Indonesia. Thank you for coming. Thank you also for our fellow from Australia and from India, and perhaps from other parts in the world. Uh, in the world. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we are privileged to learn more about the sustainable development goals and how this pandemic has uh, brought more challenges to our goals. We have, as uh, Prof. Caitlin said, we have multiple stakeholders perspective here. We have uh, from the academic perspective, that is from uh, Professor Desha from Australia. We also will have perspective from the government, that is from Professor Akmal Tahir from Universitas Indonesia, and also from the business perspective from uh, Ms. Indah Budiani. So our, our talk will take about all together about 30 minutes and then we will have question and answer. Just like what Leah said before, I really hope you guys can uh, type your question in the question and answer box so that we can see you uh, uh, see the questions clearly. So um, to make this uh, presentation more uh, effective, can I introduce the first presenter that is from Prof Akmal Tahir. Prof Akmal, can you please turn on your uh, video? Yes, Prof Akmal Tahir. Yeah. Prof Akmal Tahir is a professor in urology, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. He is a pioneer in modern uroandrology. But not only that, he is the special staff of the Minister of Health for Health Service Improvement in Indonesia. And he is also currently the expert uh, team member of the Indonesia COVID-19 response. So we are going to learn from him what the government perspective on this pandemic. Professor Akmal, it, is uh, research was a research fellow at the Hanover Medical School and Institute for Peptide Research, Hanover, Germany. And he received his PhD from that institution in 1993, a very long time ago, older than uh, many of the participants, perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Oh, uh, back to you, uh, Professor, please. Uh, seven to 10 minutes for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Corey. Nice to see you again. Long time to see with Corey. <laughs> I will start. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take um, hopefully uh, only 10 minutes. Uh, I'm talking about the, the impact of COVID-19 to the on the SDGs progress. I don't want to talk about the the virus uh, or the virus of the uh, COVID, but I will take uh, this opportunity to talk about the more the health system perspective because this is very important. Uh, how we can uh, offer come the problem with the uh, COVID in uh, system uh, SDGs. This is the thing we all know about that we have uh, the, all of the 17 goals and then we have uh, the third is uh, the good health and well-being, but we know that it's interconnected all of the goals. I have the next slide, please. I want to show you a, a little bit how the actually in the health in Indonesia it, uh, related to SDGs. When we start as the uh, SDGs in uh, 2015, at least uh, the MDGs we can we have already uh, succeed to uh, to decrease the reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, and some of uh, HIV, uh, malaria, and tuberculosis is still problems. But yes, next slide, please. When we talk about the SDGs, there are some not other goals. Next slide, please. This is unfinished business. But new highlights in the SDGs in Indonesia is actually, we have the mortality attributed to non-communicable disease and tobacco control. And uh, another thing about drug abuse, about the traffic deadlines and uh, internal health regulation. But I will emphasize about the universal health coverage because at least when the, from the WHO perspective that uh, how we can, uh, generally we can uh, achieve the SDGs, health SDGs is true when we can uh, fulfill the universal health coverage of, of our, uh, people. I just want to say that the universal health coverage means that everybody can access all of the uh, health services from prevention, rehabilitation, treatment, anti rehabilitations And the second condition we can uh, B said that we have uh, achieved universal health coverage. Yes, we this help uh, we can access this uh, health uh, services without uh, any financial uh, hardship. In Indonesia, we try to achieve that through this JKN or BPJS. So next slide. So we can if you we uh, look a uh, deep dive in Indonesia health challenges in the last the past thirty years actually is very, very uh, uh, dramatic changes in our uh, disease pattern uh, because of human behavior changes. Next slide. In 1990, the main cause of morbidity or mortality, uh, cause of death is common disease. And uh, 30 years afterwards, next slide, please. We have a non communicable disease. This is very, very, uh, I think, very important for us because also, one third of our uh, health spending is, is from this non communicable disease. And you can see here, uh, sorry, please back, the high blood pressure, stroke, cardiovascular disease. This is actually a uh, consist of 60% of mortality in Indonesia is due to this, this uh, diseases. But uh, why? Because uh, we, until now, I have to say that until the last, uh, our basic health survey showed that we are still problem with this. Because we cannot still check, we cannot succeed until now to change our behaviors in, in as a health behavior, at least. That's why our prevalence or frequency of high blood pressure, stroke, are still increasing now. This is before the, before the pandemic come. We have still problem. And when, when the, uh, the uh, COVID come to Indonesia, and then the most of the people's infection and also mortality is also rise, similar with these conditions. That means, again, this is very, very problem for us. Next slide. 
Why? Next slide. This is what one quote. Sorry. One quote from actually this Angus Dayton. Angus Dayton is this uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner for 2013 economy. And the she he, he uh, wrote a book, Health, Wealth, and the Origin of Inequality. And he said that actually the life expectancy is increasing now in the world is not by because of cleaner water, but by medical advances and change in, in behaviors. And I'm sure that in Indonesia, we have the problem. Uh, how the Indonesian government try to change the behaviors in our people actually is of course is through education, socialization and, and other rest. Next slide. And we have to prevent all of that disease through the system. Indonesian system is the first is primary care and public health. This is the place, the, the, the first contact if people want to have a health services in Indonesia. And the second is for the hospitals and the surgery also in hospital subspecializations. And our problem now is our primary care and public health system is very weak. That because this is when we want to have a, a community in empowerment, uh, community uh, education actually uh, happen in this uh, primary care. That's why until now we have the problem. Next slide. When come the COVID pandemics, all of all of the uh, uh, SDGs uh, affected by this uh, pandemic, of course. And then next slide. Next slide, please. And also in Indonesia, I think uh, talking about SDG three, health, lives, and well-being. Uh, actually, this is uh, effect of the uh, COVID nineteen to to uh, to health system uh, to health uh, system. I think we are we I will not uh, go to the detail and what kind of, of of the disease, but you can imagine that when we have the tsunami some years ago, we lost two hundred. 1015 people but the impact to the economics is not so great but now we have only lost until now not only already 5000 but uh, the effect of economic of, of the all of the jobs economic growth is so so severe for us that's why uh, i think it is very very important as how to uh, overcome this problem next slide again how actually was the problem? Actually, when we, you, you know about how we uh, want to have the, the, the people uh, stay at home, uh, clean their, their hands, uh, using masks and on everything, actually, everything happened in community, not in hospitals. That means everything has to be done at primary healthcare level. Again, as I told before, that this is our the most weakest of our system actually that's why i think uh, we still have problem and now uh, the government at least uh, the next months we will going into the primary health care uh, intervention you, you can see in our uh, newspaper in our media if talking about the the uh, uh, covid-19 the, the pictures is only about about the hospitals that means that I think we have to change this. This is actually ne the next action that we have to, uh, to perform is people-centered effective and safe actions. You can see here that the, what we have, uh, uh, have to do is uh, first uh, teaching the people, tracing the, 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 uh, the cases and then testing and finding the positive and make isolations. This is the way how we, we have to cut off the transmissions and everything outside the treating people actually happen in community. And that means the role of a pusses mass of community health center have a very, very important. Next slides, this is for summary. If we can strengthen the primary health care and we can have unified coverage as the conditions and as always in the, uh, uh, mentioned in the WHO that 
this is on your fret coverage is the only one very very important uh, 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 factors when we have to want to achieve the sustainable different goals thank you very much uh, i'm looking for a another question thank you Thank you very much, Professor Akmal. It's a very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, Professor Akmal has uh, emphasized the importance of primary healthcare system for the uni and also the universal health coverage. And especially, I am very. Uh, I think it's very important that you said that changes in behavior is the key in achieving good health and well-being. That is why teaching and tracing uh, is very important. And these two aspects, teaching and tracing, should be done at the community level, the primary healthcare system. Thank you, Prof. Akmal. Thank you. And our next speaker, can I get the, the whole uh, Zoom, please? Uh, yeah. Our next our next speaker is uh, an academic, an academician. That is Professor Cheryl Desha from the School of Engineering and Built Environment. Cheryl is working toward resilient and regenerative cities through encouraging evidence-based decision-making, a very important uh, work, Cheryl. Now we really want to learn more about how to be resilient, how to rebuild our cities. Uh, we are so delighted that your work includes partnering with industry and government to deliver right time and right place knowledge and skills using nature inspired, nature loving and place based approaches. Um, we, we hope you can explain that a little bit, but it is, uh, we feel that it is so right to the, uh, to the problem. Cheryl is also the director for engagement industry for Griffith University and member of the city's research institute. So Cheryl, please uh, share with us your point of view about this pandemic and how can we rebuild ourselves during this pandemic. Over to you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure to be with everyone today. And I'm very excited uh, by this webinar. Uh, I love doing online work and uh, this is really a great crowd to be speaking with. I look forward to reading the comments. I think uh, my context for speaking with you uh, is around UN SDG 8, which is around business and thinking about how business is in affected by COVID exists amongst uh, COVID as a major disruption to our lifestyles and our, our, our economies. So I would like to share with you today uh, my perspectives on that and uh, thinking through the differences between big corporates through to small and medium enterprises because when we think about business and the UN SDGs, really it could be from a family unit round through to 150 employees. And we often hear about the big corporates and what they're doing around sustainable development. The reality, at least in Australia, is that 95% of our workforce is small to medium enterprises. So there's the everyday reality around COVID. And then there are the, the big corporate moves that affect our supply chain and affect our ability to have a really vibrant economy. So with that in mind, I think we can, uh, we can have a bit of an exploration to be inspired by nature. So here we go. This is my, my context. So what we are looking at here are some beautiful uh, sea uh, uh, fish. You might know them from the movie Finding Nemo. Of course, they uh, are here on one of Indonesia's reef uh, systems in Gili Truangan, which is just off the northwest coast of Lombok. And... Actually, I'm inspired to look at these creatures when I think about our interactions amidst COVID, and you would say why. And these little critters, they live amongst really quite um, venomous sea anemones with their, with their tentacles. And they live in that system and duck in and out to do their every day, to find food, to forage, to come back and to be with family. At the very slightest uh, alert, they will duck back into the sea anemone and then come out again. And you might think, 
Why does the fish waste so much energy in darting in and out at the slightest uh, uh, alert that there might be something wrong? Surely that is not efficient. Maybe you can think about that in your everyday life at the moment that we're either in the workplace or we're working from home or we're back to work or we're consulting from home. And this, this duck in and out of what we previously took for granted as being our outside systems, we might feel is actually using quite a bit of our energy. And is this really an efficient way to go? I would suggest that this creature in nature is actually highly efficient and, and has evolved over time to live quite well in those circumstances. So when we think about how we can become more resilient in our businesses, working from home, places that may not be the best places historically to do business, how do we evolve our own protective skin? These fish actually have a layer of uh, mucus on their skin that helps them coexist in, in their environment with the sea anemone. How do we shift our business mindset to have this extra skin that allows us to exist in this new normal? So that's the nature inspiration that I would like to use today for our discussion. And when we take that uh, into looking at the bigger reef system, then we think, wow, there are other big corporates. You can see the big fish here in the background who can be out in the open. Maybe there are some systems that operate in society regardless of COVID in and out that are actually quite stable. Knowing what they are, which supply chains are really stable, which uh, uh, mechanisms in society, economic mechanisms work really well, regardless of what COVID is doing to our um, supply chains and our, our retail systems, service systems. That's really important for us to understand in going forward. And then to also know which businesses, which operations can exist as the Nemo fish inside and outside of the sea and enemy surrounds that are much more localized. And so our ecosystem of our business world then takes on a really different picture. But when we think about the reef, actually reefs are changing all the time and they have cyclones. At the moment, they have a lot of extra heat stress with climate change. They're not stable, uh, stable systems as, as uh, point in time uh, stagnant systems. They're actually evolving all the time. So our, our human species is actually has a lot to learn from these kinds of systems when we think about COVID amidst other future disruptions that we may face uh, from uh, perhaps other viruses. Perhaps uh, we know uh, of some of the climate change influences, but there will be others. There might be other external disruptions. So as we look forward in our already disturbed system of economics because of COVID, how do we create that resilience to now also be agile in the face of future disruptions. And what we can see from the evidence already is that actually businesses that do well for the planet, businesses that are sustainable, actually are doing quite well economically as well. So uh, the you may have heard of the United Nations Sustainable, Solu Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, they have produced their 2020 report. And in that report, of Obviously, uh, SDG 8 has at the moment a highly negative impact, but the SDGs are clearly argued in that report that they are an invaluable framework for actually recovering from COVID-19 and creating that new sense of resilience because they have created us a framework to be able to then uh, be adaptive in that system. So actually this report uses the six SDG transformations to help us look ahead and build back better. And the report argues that they can actually be implemented in every country to address the trade-offs and synergies uh, with the SDGs. If we adopt this approach, the big corporates are telling us that this is a good way to go. So, you know, there's been recent articles in very uh, well-regarded uh, uh, publications that corporations who are using uh, the ESG uh, funds uh, approach to business. So these are funds that consider uh, economics, uh, social uh, and governance. They outperform their mainstream counterparts and sustainability uh, oriented com companies that have strategies towards this kind of resilience 
are outperforming their uh, counterparts in uh, the first quarter of 2020. So the pandemic has actually increased the performance of the um, and the investment appeal of ESG funds. So when we think about that and we come back to these six uh, transformations to achieve the SDGs, here they are. So uh, you can read more about this in that 2020 report. But my key point inside this provocation is that actually everything on this planet is connected and where it is, is very critical. So we, um, through my academic network that I'm in, we've been part of this manual of digital earth and we're taking the approach that through this sixth transformation that you can see around digital revolution for sustainable development, actually that's a pretty good place to pivot from, to focus in on, to see what's possible. So you might want to check out that publication that has been sort, uh, supported by the International Society of Digital Earth. And this really does get to the point of leaving no one behind from the family businesses through to the large corporations and looking at closing the, the, the loop on our, um, our waste streams, energy streams and so forth to decouple the uh, impact of our activities on the environment from our profit. And also I think to decouple the impacts of COVID on our economy. Uh, one of your uh, poll questions there is around uh, uh, this particular um, report survey question. Uh, they uh, canvassed around a thousand people and had their opinions on this topic of what will be the impact of COVID-19 on each of those transformation areas. So I've asked you the question around the sixth area of digital revolution for sustainable development. Keen to hear your, your thoughts on that. The report uh, from the UN SDSN also has a, an interactive map. So this is digital earth. It's about being able to measure and then manage. So when we can see what's going on around the SDG 8, then we really start to get interested in what we can do locally about it. So if we have a look at, this is the over, overarching result for SDG 8, but inside that you'll see there are a number of indicators and it's really good to get down to the indicators when we talk about the SDGs. And they all have different patterns. I'm not going to talk about what those patterns are. You can see the source of the data changes for each one. So there's lots of really great evidence pieces that are giving us an eyes in to what is going on around our planet according to the economic uh, perspective and how then that is influenced by COVID, we can track because we've got this mapping uh, line of sight into what's happening. The other thing that the this network has done is produce uh, the SDGs today. And this is a bit of, bit of a different kind of visualization. Data, again, on particular parts of the sustainable development goals uh, giving us current information on what is happening around the world, thanks to the partnership with Esri, who is a very big geospatial uh, company uh, doing this visualization work. Well, so, yes? One more minute left. One minute left. Perfect timing because this is my last slide. So, um, in terms of having this open access data platform, we have a virtual space for us to be able to think about how our systems are working around the planet in terms of adapting our supply chains, adapting our purchasing, adapting our uh, global interactions with our business colleagues and being mindful that in that adaptation, we are not inadvertently addressing uh, the other indicators in negative ways. So within the context of environmental management, this is really important to first measure and then manage in, uh, holistically. So I leave you with this picture of Nemo and a thought that actually being adaptive is quite a complex thing to accomplish. And it's conversations like these, I think that can move us closer to that as we think about what it means to be resilient to COVID for our economic systems. Um, perhaps you might be interested if you're just in uh, learning about the topic of sustainable business practice, there's a free uh, massive open online course, MOOC, that's offered through the universe, Open University of Mauritius in uh, collaboration with the Commonwealth of Open Learning that you can get to via this link. Uh, it's regularly offered. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Cheryl.
It's very interesting. Thank you to Nemo that provide us with uh, inspiration, how to be adaptive. And you said this very eloquently that uh, being adaptive is hard to achieve. We always talk about adaptive, but do we really understand that is include the shifting of our mindset and you focus on business. You, you call each uh, business to shift mindset. And you said that by focusing on the sustainable strategies, actually data shows that business outperform the, this period, period of extreme volatility and extreme changes. So the question now for those in business is how, if you really want not only to survive, but to thrive, perhaps we all have to become Nemo, how to, uh, <laughs> Uh, have to uh, more be more adaptive. You really talk about mindset. You really talk about changes, agility. Thank you for that, uh, Cheryl. And uh, Cheryl has uh, bring us to the uh, important talk that Indah, Miss Indah is going to share with us. Uh, Miss Indah Budiani ha has, has, uh, has have uh, 14 years of experience with NGO, government, private sectors on environmental and climate change issues. She is promoting the sustainable business. So uh, Ms. Inda is the right person for us to listen now. Please share with us your data, your insight about um, how business adapt in this situation. Ms. In Inda uh, is a graduate from Faculty of Law, Pajajaran University, uh, UNPAD di Bandung. And also she has got her master degree in, uh, from Germany in sustainable resource management. Uh, she is now a doctorate candidate at the Uni Universitas Indonesia on social welfare program study. She joined, uh, she is the director of Indonesia Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's very important. A council that consists of 40 member companies from 17 sectors. Ms. Indah, please share with us your thought and your insight. Over to you, Ms. Indah. Thank you, Ms. Indah. It seems like um, uh, we lost Ibu Indah. Hopefully she can join us soon. Ah, she is now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Over to you, Miss Inda. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Kodi. It's such a pleasure to join all of you here. So good morning, uh, good afternoon for you in Australia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So uh, it, it was an interesting story from uh, Cheryl about the Nemo. So perhaps I will explain you now about the Nemo. So my contact is about uh, how business, uh, wait, I will share my screen. How business practicing their sustainable business in current pandemic effect, yeah? So, but before we jump into the main message or the main question, I would like to give some overview about IBCSD. So IBCSD is a business association that has commitment to promote sustainable development. Uh, long before SDG is exist, we already promote sustainable development through the private sector. And we also part of the WBCSD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's a global network that promotes sustainable development at global level. So I think in Australia, there is a BCSD as well, uh, Australia BCSD. So we are part of the global network. And we promote the integration of SDGs in sustainable business objective and operation because it's really aligned with the uh, sustainable business concept. And we also encourage leadership and collective action in the business sector to support the achievement of the SDGs. We really uh, encourage the companies to work with the peer sectors because we believe they cannot uh, work alone. Uh, they should work with the peer sectors because if they want to voice their challenges uh, and also that their obstacle in transforming their business uh, as usual to the, uh, sustainable business, they have to voice that uh, challenges. So with, with together with other uh, 
companies, uh, I think their voice will, will be heard more. So this is the picture of the book that we created last year. It's the collection or the compilation of the private sector contribution to achieve SDGs in Indonesia. It's very interesting stories. It's downloadable in our website. Uh, there are a lot of story which is very uh, relevant with the achievement of SDGs set uh, in Indonesia. So you can read this. Uh, so this is our global network. As I mentioned earlier, we are part of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You can see how we link to each other here. So I think it's about 60 BCSD all around the world. So as you can see, WBCSD was established in 1992, while IBCSD was established in uh, 2011. So within that year, several BCSD uh, in several countries was established. So in Indonesia, the BCSD was established by the effort of Kadin, Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. So it's four years effort. It's a long, long process. So this is our prominent um, uh, and the founder of IBCSD. So we have six companies, Bakri Telkom in uh, telco sector, hosting Indonesia, which now changed the name to Semen Bangun Indonesia. It's a main industry. We have Bank Negara Indonesia from banking sector and also RIPP, part of April Group in pop and paper. And we have Garuda Indonesia, uh, perhaps you know, it's aviation industry. And we have Make Up Our Indonesia from energy sector. So now we are growing from six uh, companies. Now we have 40 companies. If we divide it by sector, we have 17 sectors. And of course we expect more companies to join us. Uh, we, we still need some sector from automotive and also from electronic because now we are looking forward for the industry 4.0. So I think that's a important sector to join our forces. So this is our main uh, message, yeah? How do the IBCSD and its members see the current pandemic effect opportunity and challenges in practicing sustainable business in Indonesia? So about, about last month, uh, we conducted a survey with several questions. So it's really answering your question, perhaps. So the first question is, are SDGs relevant to your company during and after the pandemic? And 100% saying yes. Uh, they said that achieving SDG is the corporate responsibility and they feel that consumer and stakeholders expect them to achieve the SDG. And uh, they said the advantage of the SDG is the involvement of the private sector it means that it's quite different with MDGs, the previous uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals. In SDG, it's, uh, it's, in, it's very inclusive. Not only the beneficiaries, but also the, the, the parties who can contribute to SDG, including the private sector. So this uh, SDG giving opportunity for the private sector to also contribute. And the second question that we have on the questionnaire is, do you agree that the new normal brings a new momentum for SDG implementation by business? So 91% saying yes. Uh, you know, there is some increasing intensity from uh, for poverty and unemployment. And also there is increasing urgency on education and health and also increasing uncertainty. So this make the companies uh, rethinking about their uh, business strategy. And the other question is with the new normal, will there be change in your SDG scope approach and target? 83% uh, saying yes, they, they feel that they need to adjust and also to innovate and also accelerating the action. While the rest, the 17% actually saying yes, but they feel that they actually have the, the same target. So they, they don't change the target because it's still relevant or even more relevant with the current situation. So how the current consumer perspective on sustainable business products and services? So there are some researches about this. In Indonesia, about 63% Indonesian consumer want sustainable products. So it's a research on 2017. In other part of the world, there are 75% millennials change buying habit and 90% British consumer willing to pay premium price for cycle or cyclable products. So if you see the graph, there's an increasing trend for sustainable products. There's another statement from uh, Pete Davis, is a CEO on a sustainable business uh, firm. Uh, related to the pandemic, uh, he said that in all likelihood, consumers are going to more readily turn to companies they believe 
have the public's best interest in mind. And he also said that with masks, gloves, and disinfectant wipes in hand, folks are going to be judicious with their dollars. Uh, so if you ask yourself uh, if you want to repair your air conditioner, there is two options. One, those who just doing the business as usual, you know, without this mask, gloves, and disinfectant, and those who show that they have provided their employee with this kind of health uh, tools. So I'm sure you are going to choose the second option. Means that unconsciously you prefer the companies who are aware about the health and also the safety of the consumer. So the, the last question, I think, how could business benefit from practicing and promoting sustainability as a key principle in recovery from pandemic? So uh, IBCSD having web series, so we, so from the web series, we can collect the best practices from our member, how they cope with the pandemic and how they get benefit from this pandemic. So from April, with the existing uh, COVID-19 pandemic that have made several economic impact, it reaffirms the company's commitment towards nature and science-led progress and sustainable growth for April business. So they're practicing and promoting sustainability because they feel it's the key principle to survive from the current situation to carry out its business. So there are uh, two main objectives uh, from the companies. Uh, first, to ensure health and safety of employees. So of course, it's very important. And as well as the employees' family and supporting surrounding community. And second is uh, maximizing their effort to able to manage uninterrupted operation. So they still, uh, of course, continue following the sustainable forest management uh, policy 2.0 commitment, which focus on advancing the science-based understanding of tropical land landscape and ensuring their action directly tied to the sustainable development goals. So this is my last slide. It's another story from L'Oreal Indonesia. You know, it's a cosmetic company. So this is very interesting as well. Uh, for me, the, the one who is most interesting is a uh, salon partner support. Uh, they provide training for the SME, uh, the salon, which buy their product. Yeah. So I think this is also the strategy from the company to maintain the relationship with the buyer. So after the pandemic, they hope they still have the SME running the same business. So they still have the, the consumer buying their product. So I think that's my last slide. So I'm happy for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Inda. You have provided us with a lot of data and, and it's really eye-opening how the business sectors see the pandemic. So using the uh, framework that Professor uh, Desha has shown us, the importance of mindset, I can see from your presentation how um, many corporations see that uh, achieving the SDGs is a corporate responsibility. So that is their mindset. And they also see that uh, uh, believe that consumers are going to choose companies they believe have the public's best interest in mind. So perhaps this helped them to focus more on the um, public's interest. So you talk first about mindset and you also talk about adjustment, including innovations. In your presentation, you said there's a lot of innovation has uh, is an ongoing in the companies. And also I'm very much interested in your third point about accelerating actions. So this is not only about uh, ideas, but also about adjustment and taking concrete actions. Either that is in terms of uh, um, training for the employees or for the cust uh, customers. Thank you very much, Ms. Inda, very uh, insightful. So everyone, uh, can I uh, have all the uh, presenters video on please? We, are, we have several questions, important questions, interesting questions. Because of the time constraint, please allow me to combine some questions so that uh, the uh, panelists can answer these questions. First question prof, uh, is di directed to Professor Akmal. Professor Akmal, this is from two people, from uh, Boy Siddhartha and Angel. 
I combine these, these two questions. This is the question. Since behavior changes is the key in achieving SDGs number three, who should be responsible in changing the behavior? This is a, a, a logical, but a very key questions. And yeah. perhaps is there anything that the new task force need to improve? Or perhaps they need to have a new mindset or a new behavior, a new approach, because like you said, behavior changes is the key. Over to you, Prafakma. Thank you very much. Very good questions. Uh, the uh, behavior changes first uh, should be taken by the national task force first, <laughs> before the other person. Yeah. And uh, this uh, it is very serious because uh, we just finished uh, we just appointed it as the new task force two weeks ago. And then uh, the first week we have already uh, uh, decided that only two things that the national task force for uh, endemy will do. The first is behavior changes. The second is only health management. Mm. And then we are uh, discussing also about the how to uh, make behavior changes. Who are responsible? Uh, this is the, the answer is very, very normative. Everybody is responsible for, <laughs> for behavior changes. But uh, we uh, try to manage this uh, uh, behavior changes in, into one or uh, one special uh, uh, section in our uh, task force uh, dealing with this. We mm -hmm. just try to how to uh, involve everything everybody uh, we make use the we call it the penta helix approach mm. Mm. the governments the academians the ngo the private sectors and uh, we have also the uh, now the uh, relawan yeah? the mm. volunteers volunteers i think we try to to make this and then uh, the, from the government point of view we use this the the government's uh, structures. Uh, I think Indonesia has a unique government structures actually because we have the government structure from the top until to the to RT RW, yeah, from the mm -hmm. province districts and sub districts and to, into the village. And then mm -hmm. we try just try to uh, the, the 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 strategy is just try to uh, give all of the information first about what kind of we have changes. We started with the of using masker, using hand, hand hygiene, and then, and then, but we know that this is not enough. Just, just give information, uh, knowledge is not means that behavior changes is happen. The very positive uh, driver and very negative driver also, when somebody has buy the idea uh, to act as a uh, uh, behavior. That's why I think uh, that's until now what we think. So we are very, very, very serious with behavior changes. Mm -hmm. And we, oh, why? Uh, there is one another reason why we have changes actually. Because now we cannot thinking again to make an, some kind of lockdown. Mm -hmm. I think in New Zealand, in Australia, mm -hmm. sometimes they can still use this strategy to make a lockdown. But from the economic reasons, Indonesia is, is not impossible to re come to, to uh, make a lockdown again. That means that we need the, 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 uh, the discipline is not for the, for the community, but in the level of individual or in the family. Thank you. That means that that we have to do because we cannot, uh, uh, this is the, the economic perspective is, is not impossible. That's why the behavior change now is a combination of uh, per, per means of uh, persuasive approach and also some mitigation approach, how to discipline people. This is uh, all or none situation in Indonesia. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, Prof Akmal. So Prof Akmal is very open to the idea that everyone needs to change their, their mindset. We all need yeah. to change that. And it should start from the top, from the- yes. uh, exactly. 
Satgas itself. Operational task for itself. <laughs> yeah, from the task for itself. So Prof. Akmal uh, highlighting the importance of being a role model, the importance of having yep. champions, people who do uh, the uh, behavior, uh, correct behavior in regard to this pandemic. He also highlighting the importance of family and also uh, public educations. Thank you for that, Prof. Akmal. Second question, perhaps I would like uh, Prof. Uh, Desha to answer this question because this is from two people actually. One from Indonesia, Universitas Sriwijaya, and one from Vietnam. Uh, I will read the questions for you and for everyone. COVID-19 pandemic threats, uh, pandemic, sorry, COVID-19 pandemic threats the achievement of 2030 agenda for sustainable development, which may decline the enthusiasm to meet vigorous goals which will be achieved. In my mind, all governments across the world, hang on a sec, all government across the world should stress the importance of multilateral cooperation among countries in dealing with the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, especially to alleviate poverty and achieve equitable prosperity. So they are uh, focusing on the multilateral, multilateral cooperation. They also said that COVID-19 pandemic affects all activities, including university education, which demands university change from the face-to-face -face learning process to virtual learning. So this is another question. My question is, what are the opportunities and challenges of virtual learning and how government and publics prepare university resiliency to face the unforeseen crisis. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful reflection and such a timely question because I think everywhere around the planet, universities are really struggling uh, with uh, enabling our teaching and learning and also enabling our research to continue uh, amidst the COVID disruptions. Some of that relates to reduced uh, budgets available from government and also from reduced student um, students being on campus. And some of it is more around the logistics of how we collaborate with our international colleagues when we're not doing so much face-to-face. -face. And suddenly we have seen the significant increase in collaborative online relationships. Actually, I'm very happy for this question because my mm. research area mm. remote immersive collaboration. And this building just behind me here was just finished in November. Beautiful building for teaching and learning for engineering. Mm -hmm. We only had four weeks of students being on campus to use this building and then everything shut. And so I have been thinking about how you use this type of facility. I think it's the same for other types of business too. It's not just university. When our, when our normal is to use spaces and build spaces like this and our future normal must be to reimagine our spaces and and how we use them this building has the capacity to also be a training center for disaster response and disaster management that's its future uh, so as we look at that i think there's a really important message for universities and that is that we know from our from our wise elders from our indigenous elders that we learn ultimately through sharing stories. And actually learning can happen virtually or face to face. Mm -hmm. It's not whether either or, it's how. So are we, are we learning through sharing our experiences and stories internationally, locally, and building on that? And I think we are very lucky that technology is at the right place at the right time for us to use it. So Zoom, many other platforms are available for us to do this remote an immersive collaboration that has an equivalent level of trust either mm -hmm. between like, the teacher and the student or, um, or also the researcher and the researcher mm -hmm. who are physically in different places but who feel comfortable enough to open the mind to explore and to learn and I think that is actually really exciting so even though I started with quite uh, um, an anxious concerned context I think actually the future is exciting we just need to deal with the uh, a bit of tiredness, I think, mm -hmm. that exists in everyone feeling fatigued around this first part of responding yeah. to. 
I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you very much. Again, you uh, uh, emphasis the importance of mindset how we can uh, should change our mindset, we can use the facilities to perhaps other things. And also you uh, uh, highlight the importance of trust. Uh, more and more I can see um, the importance of behavior, mindset, way of thinking, uh, adaptation, trust. And yeah, perhaps we need more uh, uh, psychologists to be involved in this. Topic, yeah? you know, and I'm an engineer, so I will be the first to say that I only know this much psychology, enough to be dangerous, but it makes sense <laughs> like that. I'm, I'm sure you are more than an uh, uh, expert in this area, uh, Cheryl. Thank you very much for highlighting this. The next question is for uh, Prof. Akmal again, perhaps because you are uh, representing the government. This is a question from uh, Umi. Umi from Universitas Brawijaya. Not only she has this question, but four other people are interested in this question. She is asking in relation to SDGs number three. I summarize her questions. She's asked which areas need to be prioritized in terms of a health sec, uh, uh, SDG number three. More remote area or less remote area? And then is there any different financial financial support for these two areas uh, from the government perspective. Thank you, Prof. Akmal. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, for the, uh, the first, I will uh, re-emphasize about the how we, uh, the, the importance of how to, to uh, strengthen the primary health care, whether in the urban or in the rural, is actually is now it's the same because now mm. uh, we have already in Indonesia. I, I, I think at least it's a maybe fifty five percent already also in the, in the urban area now. Uh, but uh, usually in the government, we uh, give the priority uh, for the first for all of the for example mm. for the to take, tackling the 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 uh, pandemic now. We of course we give prioritization for the uh, area with the highly prevalence of pandemics. I think this is logical. Before uh, pandemic area, we give the prioritization in six provinces who we felt mm -hmm. the matern high matern matern mortality. We give use all indicators and then we try to, uh, to combine all of the health indicators and then we choose the six areas. This is the, the first. And six uh, provinces will get the priority uh, as a priority. Actually, uh, include was already around sixty percent of the people in Indonesia. Actually, but in remote area, the problem is uh, uh, another uh, considerations because usually in remote, especially in very remote area, very this is a political. This is affirmative action from governments. For example, we're talking about Papua, we're talking about for 5 million people. But we cannot uh, say that we want yeah. we, we to have the, to decrease the maternal mortality in mm. national uh, context. It's very, very small contribution for that area, actually. But due to the social and political considerations, we have to also give a lot also of money to this area. So. I think I hope I, I already answered the, the 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 questions because usually first of course we give the very high priority with the high prevalence of disease, very populated peoples, but at the same time we choose also the another consideration how to uh, to give the uh, priority in the uh, remote and and remote area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof. Akmal. Um... So I think it, it is very comforting that you said that everyone in Indonesia or everyone in the world is important. No one yes. is less important. That is very comforting, very wise, and we, we are so uh, willing to support the government. Next question is for uh, Ms. Indah. Ms. Indah, this is an, a question for, um, hang on a sec. 
from Bobby Tobing, and I will uh, combine this with a question from, oh, it's missing. Uh, okay, this, this is changes, but I remember the question, so I will combine it. The question is, um, how does your organization take part in perceiving the growth of social enterprise, uh, which its business using wasted product? with purpose to eliminate environmental issues. So what is your, your organization do to support them? Is there any chance for your organization to promote their business? Because you said, or based on uh, 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 Cheryl's uh, uh, presentation that business does promote SDG tend to over, uh, to pro uh, 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 have a better productivity than others. Uh, so how can you support them or perhaps promote them? As we have seen that products produced and made by upcycling are getting increased and most liked by the consumers. So uh, Bobby Tobing is saying that the consumer also like this, just in line with what you are saying. Uh, I combine this with another question that I ask you to provide examples about business policy that encourage informal business sector to face pandemic. Uh, over to you, Ms. Inda. Okay, thank you, Ibu Kori. So uh, my answer is that uh, we promote, uh, because talking about waste is part of the uh, sustainability topic, right? And we promote the companies, our member, to do some uh, circular economy approach, meaning that mm -hmm. Uh, if they have some ways, they should uh, use it again. So because some of uh, the companies cannot use this kind of materials, we promote uh, or, or encourage them to work with the uh, service uh, provider who can use this kind of material. Mm -hmm. So we have some uh, of our members who do this kind of uh, recycling with uh, the other uh, service uh, provider on waste uh, management product, not only plastic, but all of uh, waste. So we have several uh, companies uh, who is on our uh, database on that. So another question uh, is about the informal sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good question uh, because IBCAT is uh, work with the big companies. So that they uh, mostly are uh, formal sector, of course, but answering your question, perhaps first they have to uh, conduct a healthy protocol. That's very important in the first place uh, to, to pre prevent the spread of the disease and also to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And another thing is perhaps they have to, uh, you know, get more information on how the government can support them. So I think uh, the Ministry of uh, Finance uh, provides some kind of credit or loan to SMEs. Mm -hmm. So I think that they have to get more information on how they can get this kind of uh, uh, opportunity. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Inda. It is comforting to see that your organization works uh, to promote or to uh, be as the bridge between many uh, companies so that we, uh, each company can work together uh, in waste management and in other aspects. It's also good to see that you, your organization provide more information to support the informal sector and how, how they can support the SDG. Thank you for that. This questions from Muhammad Rida, not only for, from him, but two other people are uh, uh, happy with these questions. I'll, I would like answer from, from all the, par the panelists, from uh, uh, Prof. Akmal, from Cheryl, and from uh, Inda. We keep forgetting, he said, the one important aspect of behavior modification is enabling environment. Enabling environment. And from his perspective, are lacking in Indonesia. So his question is, what do you think the government, or I extend this not only the government, but the, the, the uh, uh, society, ha 
What do you think the government or the society has done in creating the environment that enable uh, people and community to thrive and becoming a better, healthier society? Prof. Akmal. Very difficult to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, uh, what I think this is my uh, opinion that. The first thing I think, uh, if you want to have the change, uh, behavior change in the in the in the uh, community, that the uh, we have to be trusted by the people. Mm. So uh, I think learning from the many countries that, uh, and also learning from the pan uh, uh, COVID pandemics. Uh, the role of the uh, decisions, the consistency of the governments, and also the science-based decisions is very, very important. Mm. Because by doing this, we can gain the uh, trust from the, the peoples. This is not easy because we have, we face the new diseases and sometimes for example, just for example, in, our, in my field, I have uh, in two months, we have to make uh, uh, clinical guidelines how to mm -hmm. treat people two or three times in two months. Usually in our fields, we change the clinical guidelines every two years. Mm. And then this is not easy because if you uh, learning from, for example, from the, from the Australia, the Congress Australia, they said that uh, they use uh, words as living documents. The guidelines mm -hmm. is living documents. You mm -hmm. can change every time this, they think there is new evidence. Mm -hmm. Because when we have to talk, we have, uh, we have to, uh, to be trusted that we can, we can give the, the reason why the evidence and sometimes the evidence is changing still yeah. because the this is the new one so we come to the management now mm. who is the in australia there's only one institution can give issues this guideline we, we also try to find this and it is not easy mm. because there is some also some uh, some variation not only variation, great variation between province, between, and then so, uh, I think uh, I will summarize that the trusted uh, governments uh, is, is very, very important. And mm. the government can get the trust from people if the decision is consistent, this is mm. sinuses and evidence-based policy. I think mm. this is one of the very important at least from my, our uh, uh, perspective of government. And sometimes mm -hmm. uh, people say that if you look at the perceptions in our survey, in our polling, mm -hmm. uh, we got around 60% uh, from one uh, uh, polling mm -hmm. about how uh, the perception of the people. I think this is uh, not good, but not so bad, but we have to try uh, yeah. Going to the uh, the uh, to this all of the situations. Mm. Once we can show to the to the, the peoples that we consistent with our decisions, I think mm -hmm. we can get uh, to uh, change the the, uh, the behavior of the people. Thanks Thank very much, Prof. Akmal. Uh, over to you, Cheryl. Yes, thank you, Professor Akmal. I think uh, I will build on your conversation. I think because as you were speaking. Uh, I was reflecting on my recent learning about our Queensland government here in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I'm an engineer, but I have been learning about the health system as part of this resilience journey in looking mm -hmm. at hospitals and how hospitals can improve their organisational resilience to COVID and other disaster disruptions. Because at the end of the day, it's the human being in the system that must be working very well for the system to work very well. So if patients want yep. good treatment, doctors and nurses and cleaners and directors must also all be working well what what i learned from the queensland system actually uh, in our in our corridor between the gold coast and brisbane it's a hot growth corridor so 
actually globally it's it's looked in as being um, a, a place to study to see mm. how rapidly growing populations mm. deal with infrastructure and changes so when yeah. when i was looking at the corridor we learned that the um, metro south mm -hmm. health and hospital service that so we have 16 one yeah. six of queensland this one in this part of our state is the only one that is fully digital and mm. a fully digitized health service means that they have patient tracking that extends beyond the usual paper-based system and one computer yep. one surgery with that you can see the evidence in the covid numbers uh, for queensland compared with the rest of the country it is my personal reflection that i think that the digitized system alongside some very very evidence-based communication from our government, our Queensland government, every right. step of the way has actually helped our community stay quite, uh, not, I won't say cheerful, but remain quietly, yeah. um, reasonably happy amidst mm. what we have experienced so far. Maybe actually we're starting mm. to feel guilty because other people in other places are having such a bad time. Maybe that, you know, there's a lot of mixed reactions there in terms of your data that you get as feedback. It's very hard, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Right, when you mm. drop. But when you look at the evidence base of the COVID cases and the yeah. rapid tracing and the clear communication from our leadership at that provincial level, the state government level, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see how the digital system, the evidence base and the clear communication are working well together to help oh. our drive uh, and keep, keep going. Our borders are closed and yet we still can go to work. We can still send our children to school. And these are the things that make the human beings happy every yeah. day. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, Inda, would you please add some? Yeah, because uh, my background is from private sector, so perhaps I would like to answer based on my background. So we are working together with the government, of course. So we, we talk about how the government can support the business sector who are uh, willing to change or willing to transform their business as usual to the sustainable business. So, uh, and then um, I think we also have to... Uh, change the behavior of the consumer mm -hmm. uh, not only the policy but the consumer so there, there is interesting story on this so there are some uh, company who is trying to doing well so they certified the product and so on mm -hmm. and they put their products on the market and then the market is just uh display from just uh uh, next to the other competitor, the same product, but, but the competitor, which has a cheaper price. And then our community still consider the price as the decision making. So then the, the company who's trying to doing well, try to rethink about, you know, they're losing their market, whether we still ha have to continue this. So they're back to business as usual. So I think mm -hmm. it's... Uh, it's very important to educate the market as well. Mm. And fortunately in Indonesia, there is um, uh, support from the uh, OJK, the Finance Service Authority for Green Finance. So uh, hopefully with this kind of support, the uh, company who's trying to do well you know, through certification and others uh, doesn't necessarily have to sell more uh, higher price than others. So this is our expectation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inda. Um, it seems that that question is our last question because we don't have much time, even though we feel that we are just, just getting there. We are just more excited about this topic. Can I uh, summarize your uh, answer to this one question? Prof. Akmal highlight the importance of trust. Trust to the government that comes from credibility, consistent and evidence-based decision-making. Your answer, Prof. Akmal, actually, uh, I, uh, based on your answer, I want to challenge the academics that come to this uh, uh, webinar today. How can we provide more evidence to the government about creating uh, an enabled environment? How can we can provide more data about changing the behavior of the society? So it is not only on the government, but it is also on us academician. And Cheryl, uh, 
provide example, a very nice example about a digitized system that provide evidence-based communication system. Again, communication system, information is what we need in this uncertainty times. But so perhaps that one we need to focus on. And Inda so brilliantly said that um, if you want a business to change, educate the con- consumers because the business, we, uh, consumer for the business is the king. So educate consumers. Again, it talk about uh, information, public education, talk about behavior changes. So uh, all the questions, all the uh, discussion, I think point out, I don't know, it's very hard to, to, to summarize everything, but perhaps we can uh, agree that um, this pandemic push us uh, so much in our uh, the achievement of SDG, but not only that, it also provides us with opportunity, opportunity to learn more, to innovate, just like Inda said. And it, it cannot happen without what Cheryl said, mindset. We need to be agile and it all start from mindset. Prof Akmal also agree with that, uh, emphasizing the importance of behavior changes. So that is the perhaps the summary of our topic today. The summary is, uh, I cannot summarize all your important uh, 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 presentation, but at least it can help each one of us to reflect what can we do uh, behavior in in, uh, changing our own behavior, helping our family, helping our society and and, and, uh, supporting the government. Um, Back to you, Leah. Thank you very much, Ibu Kori. That was wonderful sharing you have done. And then also thank you, uh, a massive thank you for all the other speakers, uh, Prof. Akma, Prof. Cheryl, and Ibu Inda for a great insight that you have given. We have uh, around uh, 450 participants joining through uh, Zoom and then also some, some hundreds from uh, the YouTube. And I'm sure it will be... Uh, increasing over time. So I hope the participants also, thank you for the participants who are joining us until the end. Uh, You are wonderful. Some of you are a regular uh, viewer for this CAPS3C webinar. Uh, And before I close, I would like to share the polling result, which is very interesting. We have uh, six questions. And now I think it's already shared. Can you see that? And for the viewer in YouTube, I would like to share the screen because I have put it quickly on, hold on. Oh, that's my, (laughs) that's my WhatsApp. (laughs) Sorry. Now I think it should be good. Yep, this is the right one. Okay. All right, hold on. So we asked the participants, which sector do you most identify yourself with? Uh, 50% are from academia, so majority of you are academics. And then 22% from national government, uh, 10% local government, uh, 7% private sector, 6% NGO, 5% community, and 1% media. And the second question is, does the pandemic change your decision-making on purchasing products? Uh, the majority of you, 56% say, yes, I prefer products from company that perform sustainable business. That's uh, uh, impressive. 37% no, it is still the same. Price and quality is my priority. Uh, and 7% no, I was buy products from company that has been conducting sustainable. Uh, mm. So that's uh, a pretty interesting. Ibuinda, this is a question uh, from you. And this is from uh, Prof. Uh, Charil. Have you heard of the free book, The Manual of Digital Earth? 27% say yes. So that's great. Se- uh, but 74% say no. So uh, Prof. Desra, uh, Prof. Charil already have uh, shared some information on that. And have you seen the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network Goals Dashboard and Report? 44% say yes and 56% say no. But Prof. Cheryl already shared the link on the chat box. And then also in YouTube, you can see that some of the, uh, the participants actually share that. So thank you very much for those of you who are uh, 
uh, you know, helping us in, 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 in managing this. <laughs> and uh, in your view, in your country, what will be the impact of COVID-19 on each of the SDG transformation, uh, digital revolution for sustainable development? 44% say mixed, 27% say positive, 7% negative, and 22% still have no opinion or too early to tell. This is question also from uh, Prof. Cheryl. And then the last question from Prof. Akmal, who do you think should take the most responsibility to take care of the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, this is a really interesting question. <laughs> 46% say government, Prof. And 6% say non yeah. organization or civil society. 12% said academicians or science community. 36% individuals, you and me and other public. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the uh, end of our uh, uh, question for the poll for today. This is interesting. We can send it to uh, the speakers for, uh, I don't know, further discussion or maybe as a base for your next research, for example. And then okay. I, I would like to use this uh, platform as well to say thank you and then to echo what uh, Ibu Kori has mentioned that, you know, other sectors need to to be on uh, to the achievement of this, so it's not only the uh, specific sector such as uh, engineering or like health, but also need psychologists, communication specialists, actors, actresses. You know, everybody needs to be keep in. Um, so if uh, any one of you are feeling that you know it's not my area on this, you know I'm uh, there's no connection. I'm a painter, for example. I don't have any connection to this. It's wrong. I mean, you know, you always can contribute something. Uh, anything to discuss. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for the great discussion. I hope it is useful for all of us as a Kites DCC's uh, goal is try to advance the um, uh, science to policy uh, discussion and research as well to help uh, more people um, uh, involved in the discussion and the research or, or other forms of activities to uh, achieve sustainable development goals and to solve climate change. So ladies and gentlemen, before I really close that, I've said that before, but we have Prof. Yatna here at the moment, which is the director of um, the uh, Institute for Sustainable Earth and Resources, um, the partner of Prof. Caitlin in this Skype's DCC. So Prof. Yatna has been a very critical in building and initiating this Skype's DCC. Prof. Yatna, Mongo. Hello, <laughs> thank you, Leah. And thank you, everybody. I'm just uh, listening a very, very remarkable discussion. I think this is really uh, even only three people, but it's really, really uh, a lot of uh, uh, remarkable arguments about this uh, COVID, the impact of COVID toward the SDG. I just, uh, I don't want to summarize because already who Corina moderator already very good summarize, summarizing all these things. But of course we are thanking for uh, pa Professor Akmal Taher, my colleague from University of Indonesia, from also academic in the Indonesia Academic of Science and, and also member of the board of University of Indonesia Last period <laughs> before Bukhari. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, Professor uh, Sheryl Desha, thank you very much. And I like the view from engineering side because we never heard that from engineering side. This is really good. And the Nemo things, I love that because that I, yeah. <laughs> my, my little bit uh, hobbies on on that uh, understanding the, the, the behavior of uh, animals. Of course, the Ibu Inda, uh, regard to everybody in the IBSD, Indonesian Business uh, Sustainable uh, uh, Development. Uh, of course, Ibu Lia is always becoming the champion for the, the webinar. We are the 13, and it's not bad. 13 is always good. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard this really uh, from the beginning up to the end of this discussion. 
and I'm really happy that you know that. Of course, the pandemic its uh, impact is very big, and discussing about SDG three, three and eight, it's a very good because previously we have been discussing about SDG. 13, 14, 15, and also, of course, the more specific on the endemic in the early, but I think this is really a lot of uh, development on the, how do we tackling the, the uh, pandemic from Professor Akmal Taher. I, I believe that uh, the next will be also discussing about innovation, you know, how we get this uh, low carbon development during the pandemic. It's also because I think ideas of low carbon development is very good, but what's happened with the pandemic? Is it still people thinking of it? But I heard from Guinda is really good. That they still keep uh, promising that circular economy and many others are still in the good shape. So pandemic is not a problem. Of course, problem for the health issue, but yeah. uh, of Akmal, the, with the new vaccine coming, I think that will be, <laughs> hopefully will be very soon. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic will be over. Thank you everybody again. Uh, good afternoon for Indonesia and then good late afternoon for the Australian. Thank you very much, Leah. Terima kasih, Pak Yatna. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, I think it is, you know, reaching the end of this discussion. Uh, I would like to say thank you again for Ibu Kori for the wonderful chairing. You know, it's very smooth discussion that we have. And then also a great insight from Prof. Akmal, uh, Prof. Sheryl, and Bu Inda. And then good closing from Pak Yatna and then uh, opening early on from Prof. Kathleen. It's great to have you all here and then all the participants who are you know, uh, I think I think I feel like the closeness with the participants right now because like we've been meeting each other like each week, <laughs> and next week is our last webinar for this series. Um, but don't worry, we will have a break for like two or three weeks because we are cooking something uh, uh, bigger, which is a high level dialogue, uh, uh, which will be coming up uh, sometimes in September. But for next week, it will be very interesting because we are talk. We will talk about the alternative funding for low carbon development, which is you know people are questioning right now. You know what's happening with the low carbon development right now? Uh, um, uh, where are we now in the climate actions and sustainable development as well because of this uh, COVID pandemic? How do we uh, source some additional or alternative fundings for that? So please stay in tune. And then also just a reminder: usually we have this every Thursday, but for next weeks it will be on Wednesday because Thursday will be a public holiday in Indonesia so we want to move it like one day early so uh, please be mindful that it's on Wednesday so I know because some of you already remember that catch this is every Thursday uh, next week is on Wednesday and then after what we will have a break for a, a few weeks and then we will come back again with a series of high-level dialogue so by that, uh, thank you again for uh, all the attention and for the participants for joining us until the end. Handy that this will take in charge, uh, take over to uh, explain to you about the certificate and the materials as well. Um, and by that, then see you next week on Wednesday. And thank you again. Uh, thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> ya. Terima kasih Cheryl. Terima kasih. Thank you, Thank you Ibu Kori. Thank, Thank you Ibu. Saya izin lift ya. Terima kasih yeah. sama yeah. Mantap banget tadi, Bu. Thank you banyak, Lia. Psikologis kita perlu. <laughs> Oke, okay, Handika, um, you take over ya. Uh, participants, Pak Yatna, see you. See you. Terima kasih, Bapak. Bapak Ibu, thank you very much for those of you who have joined us through the end.
uh, you could download our the presentation materials of the speakers in the latest in the link in the latest post of the Facebook page of Institute for Sustainable Earth and Resources. And for those of you who would need a certificate, you could fill one of the links uh, on the right side of the screen. Yeah, you could just uh, fill one. Uh, it's it leads to the same form. But it's just in case there is there is two access for just in case. Uh, for those of you who don't have Facebook account, I believe you could still open the to open the link and you could still see the uh, the, the post uh, but if it's a problem I will uh, send also the presentation link when I send out the e-certificate Uh, we will about the, there is a questions about next webinar. We will uh, try to share the information as soon as possible. But when it's already available, it will you could find it in the Facebook page, and also we will also email it to you. Thank you very much, Bapak Ibu, who have joined us. Thank you.
uh, for questions about materials via email, I will send it uh, the link via email, but it will take some time because I will need time to process the e certificate. Uh, but yes, it will be sent to you. But if you need it fast, I advise you to check it in the Facebook page. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Bapak Ibu, who have allocated their time uh, to join us today. Uh, I will so soon close the Zoom room. If you have any troubles, you could contact me via uh, WhatsApp or email. Uh, but please ensure that it will be still in the time limit mentioned. Uh, I will soon close the, this Zoom room at 12.25. Okay, thank you very much and see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Oh, there is a trouble.